Hi everyone, welcome to the Accents YouTube channel and to my conversation with Lenora Hay, or we know her as Lenny Hay. Hi Lenny, welcome to the show. Thank you, glad to be here. Wonderful to talk to you. I'm going to read your bio now, I think it's totally fascinating. Lenny Hay is a 2019 MFA graduate of Spalding University. She grew up in the Midwest between two cultures, Chinese immigrants and Russian German farmers. She lived in Louisville for nearly 50 years and now lives on the water in Southern Indiana and Florida, drawing energy from visual art, her family's history and music. So I would like to start our conversation from the beginning. I would love to know what it was like to grow up in the uh, intersection of several cultures, Chinese, Russian, German, and American. Um, if I think about the, the two main cultural groups, within each, um, there was richness and warmth and uh, things that are embedded in me, love of food, um, generosity of spirit, uh, but in the larger world, uh, because I felt, sometimes I would say to myself when I was older, neither fish nor fowl, or my sister and I would say we're mutts, because we were not, didn't feel truly um, Chinese, we didn't speak, you know, we were American born, and in the, the German culture, um, I felt somewhat of an outsider. We looked so different, the visual, and we didn't live in the general area where the others did. People never, the family um, on that side, which I happen to be visiting right now, never made me feel that way, but I felt other. I felt other most of my life. Um, and in, in some ways, uh, I, I came to terms with it when, when I started teaching. And I, I taught kids um, who were not privileged and were kids of color. And I, I, I really, I, I felt like I did not know what it's like to be them, but I knew what it was like to be outside the mainstream of our country and our society. And I, I hope, I hope that helped me um, with empathy and understanding as a teacher in that situation. And I hope it has in, in other situations. Um, but it was, it was, it was kind of a strange, sometimes I think of it as a fault line. You know, I straddled the fault line uh, most of my, my life. Um, I love the fact now at this late stage of my life that I've had all the richness of those experiences, um, but it speaks as much, I think, to the, the nature of our culture and country as it does to, uh, to my situation. Although I know today it is much more common to be of mixed backgrounds than it was in the 50s. It was, that was, that was, and especially when we grew up in Northern Minnesota when I was a child, you know, and there were Scandinavians and Germans and, and oh, you know, it was, it was quite waspish. Um, so, that, you know, there, it was, it was an interesting, um, but sometimes uh, challenging road to walk as a child. Uh, I wanted to be like everybody else, you know, which is what you do often when you're a child. And uh, I felt outside that. What about now? Is this to oh. have the, I want to be everybody? No. no, no, I want to be young sometimes, I think, but no. Um, no, I, I think I think I've pretty much come to terms with it. Um, uh, a couple of things have contributed to that. Um, I think I see I see in the world the visual 
uh, nature of this country and beyond has just changed enormously. And um, I embrace that and, and feel, feel more a part of that larger sense of, of the people of the world. And I also think um, I have written myself through some of the challenges. Um, I, 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 I think um, some of my poetry was about um, helping my parents live again. You know, I had lost them. And it was also a way of me thinking through and working through emotionally and spiritually, you know, some of, of my own experiences. And I think that has helped me come to terms with it. Um, so I, I think less about that than I once did. Although um, I, still, I still feel a tie that, that's odd, that's, you know, because I don't share the language, but it's, it's a part of the culture and it's about the person I knew as my father and, and what he gave me um, from his culture and his, um, what he believed in, so. Uh, one of the reasons for this interview, actually the occasion of this interview is that your poem won the uh, inaugural local accents uh, contest. And I would like for us to hear it now and then we'll continue with the questions. Take you just a moment to pull it up. The title is American Politeness. May I ask a personal question? They say, I am weary of strangers assumed right to know me, my weight, religious preference, sexual orientation. I chuckle silently, weighing an answer this time. Raised docile, I smile, yes. Where are you from? Always the follow-up. Their false politeness prompts my answers meant to confuse. Minot, Crookston, Minneapolis, then Kentucky, where I was born, grew up, got educated, and learned how fellow citizens position me outside their landscape, pin me on a map in a foreign place for those who have silky black hair, pale skin, eyes like mine. I prolong my naivete. My interrogators squirm in confusion and discomfort. They hope that people who look like me took a boat here or flew adopted to the land of the free. I acquiesce as if I did not speak their language Oh, you mean, what is my ethnicity? My father immigrated from China. My mother was the daughter of German Russian immigrants. I was born on the plains of North Dakota, near wheat fields and under endless skies. I hope they feel my words like a slammed door, like a gut punch. Wow, Lainey, this poem is like a gut punch. Um, and I will say that it was very personal to me, that poem, not because people ask me about my ethnicity. They look at me and they don't expect that I'm an immigrant. They hear me speak and they immediately ask, you know, where are you from? And I hate that, okay? I hate that. Uh, they don't say, may I ask you a personal question? They immediately say, hey, where are you from? And uh, you said this time, so I'm going to ask you about that. But when they ask me where you're from, sometimes I joke. And mm -hmm. I say, I'm from Shelby County, or I'm from, uh, from Kentucky, or, and then they continue prodding, wait, 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 where are you originally from? Because they just 
you know, keep on wanting to know. And then I end up telling them I'm from Bulgaria. And they immediately ask, and where are you from? <laughs> That's my, <laughs> where are you from? So I have the right to know too. Yes, yes. That's a, that's a great word, yeah, yeah. What, so what, what about you when you say this time? Do you, do you sometimes give answers that are, do you sometimes not tell the truth? Um, no. I mean, I probably, this poem was the result of like um, um, an amalgamation of memories and experience. Right. And, it, you know, it happened multiple times. And more so when I was a child, a teenager, um, an undergraduate student, you know, uh, and I think sometimes I was just very polite and I filled in the pieces for them. Like I knew what they were after and I would give it to them. But I think what this poem was trying to do was to be um, more, genuine about how I felt even when I was being, I was being polite and, um, and what I had hoped to say. Although sometimes I actually gave some of those answers and kind of enjoyed a little bit their confusion. You know, when I'd say, oh, I was born in Minot, North Dakota. I was like, really? <laughs> you know, so, yeah. And, and the poem is about being othered. Yes. And, yes. Uh, uh, and I think that you did an amazing job conveying that feeling and walking us through the step of, okay, again, I know what this is and I know why they are doing it. And am I going to comply this time? Fine, I will, but I hope they don't feel good about it. So there is so much, there is so much in this poem in terms of um, uh, politics even, in terms of expectations, interpersonal relationships, uh, but there is also a lot of uh, discussion. Well, we could have a lot of discussion about what is home, what is country, where does one belong? So what is home for you, Lainey? You've lived in multiple places. Yes, yes. Um, varied places are home. Uh, not due to uh, my current knowledge and experiences of those places, but of my memories. Um, I am visiting right now someplace I was born, um, but as I, I told my niece last night, but I'm a stranger here, yeah. but there are some things about it I recall and nearby the farms of my grandfather and, and my uncles uh, and, and so on in this area. There is a part of that that's home to me. Um, I walk in restaurants, small restaurants, um, family run restaurants. And there's a sense of home because that's, I, I grew up in a, in a restaurant like that. So there's a sense of home there. Um, and then, then where, my, where my husband and my children are, wherever that happens to be. And, and where my books are <laughs> is kind of like, I can make a nest. I can make a home there. Um, you know, I believe in the possibility of this country, but it it it's it's been such a struggle. In in fact, I'll say, speaking of the politics of this poem, I may not have written this poem had there not been the rash of attacks on Asian Americans. Um, irrational on the streets. And it, it called up to me um, in current times for other people and feeling with them the sense of otherness in so much more violent way than I ever experienced. But but you know that was that was the timing of that that poem what I wrote about a year ago. Yeah. 
So, so I hope I answered. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned a restaurant and I happen to know that you have worked all your life, practically, Lenny, uh, since seven years old. Tell us about your first job. I did, I did. My, my daddy, I wanted to work. And um, in those days, they had a great big uh, dishwasher in the kitchen, much different than today, big steel thing. But they washed the glasses in this special water, you know, with all kinds of, I'm sure, you know, disinfectant on brushes and then rinse them and put them up. So when I was seven, they decided that was a job I could do. They didn't want me waiting on tables or doing anything else. So I did that. And um, every week, um, dad would walk me to the bank and I put in half my pay and, and keep the other half. But um, I also played in the restaurant. My mother worked there too. So they took me to work before I went to school. And I, um, I, I threw tennis balls against the walls when there weren't customers. And I, I went back where the pastry chef worked and took all her things down and played like I was baking and she'd be really upset the next day with daddy but um yeah the restaurant was home was home to me uh, for sure so what was the name of the restaurant um there were different ones but Sydney's cafe was the restaurant where we spent the longest time, probably um, about 13 years in Northwestern Minnesota. Um, and others, I was younger. There was a Victory Cafe here in Minot where I am. Um, there was another one in Grand Forks. Um, they were serial, not all simultaneously, um, that I, I was too young to know. But, but Crookston, that restaurant was from the time I was two until I was about 15. Um, was, was that right? And Sydney's my father's name. So. Oh, okay, okay. And yeah. um, so what kind of foods did they serve? Well, you know, they, they told us when daddy first opened it, he, he made lots of Chinese. He was a wonderful chef, an amazing, amazing chef. He made all kinds of Chinese food, but um, the, the clientele wasn't that interested in that whole range. So ultimately the menu looked more like um, uh, good American cooking, steaks, chickens, burgers, whatever. And then aside, you know, the kind of Americanized Chinese food that people were used to. Uh, fried rice, egg foo young, you know, um, but, but nothing, nothing really, not what we ate when he cooked, you know, so yeah. What he was, can I ask what he cooked for you? Oh, I, everything. Uh, everything. I, he, you know, everything from from uh, calamari to a little octopus in in soup to very simple things. You know, wonderful stir fried vegetables with beef in oyster sauce. Um, he would steam whole fish. And uh, with the head on, which was quite, really quite an issue to my sister and me because we couldn't stand looking at the head of the fish, but it was delicious. And then just with um, oil and bacon and scallions over the top, um, lots of rice always. I can't believe how much rice I ate when I was a little kid. I mean, I don't think I could eat that much rice anymore. He also made duck. You know, he made his own version of, of roast duck and used a huge cleaver to chop it into the little bite-sized pieces. Um, I just thought he was, I, I just thought he was a genius in the cook kitchen. And he used to say, he wasn't a great businessman, which is why we had different restaurants, we, we moved. But he was a marvelous chef. And uh, he used to say, you know, cooking is an art. Yeah, it and is. Yeah, I mean, he, he believed that, you know, his work was, and it was admired. Anyone who ate his food, um, my mother's family who would come to visit, um, it, you know, friends in the community, it was a small town, loved his cooking. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, and I, it took me a long time after he died. He died when I was young, 17. Uh, uh, it took me a long time to be able to eat in a Chinese restaurant because his seasonings were so wonderful. 
And I was, I was not of the age that I wanted to learn to cook. I wish I had. My sister, who's older than me, did learn much more of cooking from him than I did. So like, food's very important in my growing up, very important in, in, my, uh, in my life. What about in your poems? Do you write about food? Oh, yes. <laughs> People have said my poems can make them hungry sometimes, but yeah, yeah. It always it always enters in because it was it's so much of, of you know of who I am, what I remember from childhood, and uh, and it it meant it meant gathering. It meant you know eating food together with family was was about was about being together and about love, and it was how my father gave of himself, his generosity. He was not a man of any wealth but he was a man of, of great generosity with sharing his food. And he said, that's why you cook. That's why you have anything is to share it with your friends, you know? And, and I love that. And food is really at the center of that for me from that experience. How lovely. Thank you, Lenny. Now it's time for us to, read, to hear more poems. Would you like to share? Yes, I will, I will. Um, we were talking, I don't know, um, is, is, I've shared a few ones with you. Is there one you would rather? Um, read them all. Pardon me, read them all? Yeah, what read them all, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna start with the one called Minnesota Waters. Um, I recently lost my sister, my older sister. And um, this has, this is a braided poem of past and present around her. So I'll read it, it's called, Minnesota waters. I walk Minneapolis trails, cross two bridges spanning the Mississippi River. My sister sprinted by Itasca Lodge. We raced to the river's headwaters. Step rock, balance, step rock. Under St. Anthony Bridge, mighty river churns, brown spring water, pulsing through neat arteries. She drove us to Maple Lake, weekend cottages, dreamy boys in speedboats. I wanted her pink lacy swimsuit. Red and blue sculpture erupts from the ground. I walk around the beautiful wound on Minneapolis's skin. Children filed into the vestibule, dip fingers in a cold marble font. She crossed herself with holy water. I did too. Thirteen black granite columns line the banks where I walk. Thirteen people drowned when a bridge collapsed. We shoveled horseshoe slew to skate raced the boys before frigid air slowed us, held up by strong waters. My sister needs care to move from wheelchair to bed. Remember what day she gets a bath, ages of her children. We crossed the gurgling source, 10 feet wide bracelets of stones, painted dark by chilly water, she crossed first, I followed her everywhere. We cross the street to the park. I follow her electric wheelchair. Land of 10,000 lakes. She laughed at my belief in big numbers, Paul Bunyan and his blue ox. A pink plastic mug fitted top secure in her hands. She sips cold water, winter and summer. We watch birds drink from a puddle, laugh at their antics, gasp when they swoop near us. She drops her cup and I retrieve it. She spills her water, I wipe her hand. Rocky streams, rivers frozen early, lakes tangled green, freshness of grateful youth, Blessed pools. Thank 
Shall I read another? Please. Okay, okay. Um, this next one was written um, in 2018, which was a, a, a momentous year, I felt, in our nation's history, 50 years of anniversaries of tragedies in this country. Um, it was also the year of the, of the school shooting in South Florida um, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And it was also the year of my 50th high school reunion. So this poem, um, which was published in um, an anthology, The Boom Project, uh, really uh, memorializes, uh, in, in a sense, the 50 years between 1968 and 2018. The whole world is watching Valentine's Day footprints, tracks of blood. Hands on shoulders, heads down, lines of armed police create a path from dead classmates, bloodied teachers. They search for a pathway as the young did watching 50 years ago. Promises broken by middle-aged white men dropping bombs, drafting the young. Protesters marched Michigan Avenue crowded Grant Park. Frozen black and white photos showed collisions, mace and billy club eru eruptions. Watching August swastikas, torches burn holes in Charlottesville streets. Young men, tight knots of rage, clashes, crashes, blood curses, contaminate streets, mow down a young believer. There can be no blame on both sides for murder. Watching a voice silenced in Memphis, another felled, a graceful sequoia stretched future bound in LA. Words, miserable retorts, a country stands guilty on broken bodies, stained young souls strain to accept the sins of their elders. Watching Chicago's words held high, Dow earns while people burn. Watch Florida's young chant a choice, children or guns. A tunnel strewn with condolences and corpses, yet we eat our young. Sin simmers 50 years, Vultures overhead snatch breadcrumbs. Wow. Wow, Lenny. Um, both of these are amazing. Um, but I'm gonna start talking about the second one, which is so unfortunately and tragically relevant to what is happening today in the news and you're a teacher you were a principal you mm -hmm. have spent i mean how many years in education um total in, uh, including working for a, a a nonprofit company um over 40 years over 40 yeah. years over 40 years and um i hope you have never had personal experience direct experience with shooting in the school? No, no, but I did, I, I, I do remember, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't. But things changed from my experience in schools in the 90s because I took weapons away two or three times. Nobody threatened, but these young people brought them to school. And the reason we knew it um, is what I told the parent is what we should feel good about. And that is other kids came to the adults and said, we know so-and-so has something in his locker or we know so-and-so has something um, in her backpack. Um, they never threatened other kids, but, but in my previous 20 some years, I had never experienced guns like that. Um, 
children fought and, you know, we broke up fights and, you know, there was, you know, other kinds of, of violence that, that was disturbing. But the guns in the 90s began and, and continued and, and it's, it's horrifying beyond, you know. So these children who brought guns to school and you took them away, did they say mm -hmm. why? I mean, what was their thinking? Um, I think in some cases it was um, uh, it was things that were happening outside of school and they wanted to be able to, you know, brandish something if they were threatened, you know, on the way home or outside of school. In other cases, I think it was just um, uh, non-thinking, you know. What I got, was, right? See what I, yeah. Yeah, you know, it was a big deal. Um, and yeah, yeah. So, but in your opinion, it's getting worse. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. yeah. I, I was at, in Florida in, um, in the school when they were opening, um, I guess, a, not a mural, but uh, something like a statue. Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't a statue. It looks looked very much like a trailer, trellis and gazebo, and people oh, okay. and people's. Um, uh, in 2019, on a year anniversary of, of the shooting, so they mm -hmm. were unveiling that. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. It was beautiful and sad there and students and parents and teachers were there just walking around and not really talking just um, it was eerie and sad and I don't think I'll ever forget that the creator of the um, I'm gonna call it trellis because I don't know what else to call it um, yeah was there also and everybody was really silent really silent about it yes. um i think that the world has changed and we need to change too don't you think lenny yes what can we do how can we change to survive and to thrive in 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 this environment Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. I know, um, I know what I have, I, a, a couple things I've resolved to myself. And one is that um, I will not become numb. It will not become um, every day. I want to look at the numbers. I want to know the facts because as a human being, I do not want to say ever to let this become, this is okay. This is a way of life. This is a normal because it's not, it's an aberration of, of what should be, um, especially, especially for children and, and, and young people. Um, and I guess as I, I will write mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and share what I can um, through my writing, um, it's it's such a multi-pronged. My niece and I, you know, we're talking briefly this morning. It's, it says, you know, there's so many pieces to it. Um, when that part of my brain, you know, the analytical side, you know, I've, I've <laughs> flipped back and forth my whole life, but <clears throat> it's got so many facets, and it, it it's really it it really is going to take a huge amount of energy and commitment and courage, um, which we seem to be desperately lacking at this time to, to address some of the root problems that, that are contributing to the larger um, loss of life, senseless loss of life in this country. But, you know, I don't know. I really like to, to I mean, I, I want to remember I wrote down two things that you said, I will not become numb and I will write. 
And I think both of them are related uh, in very real sense. And now I want to ask you, how did you start writing? How, when? Well, it was, um, it was very sporadic, a young, I remember, <clears throat> um, I remember I decided I was gonna write a novel. I always read a lot as a kid, you know, and I was a library user, hung out at the library. I was gonna write a novel and I remember starting it and I sent part of it to a young aunt of mine that I would correspond with. And I was in elementary school and she said, oh my goodness, this is impressive. Well, that I never went on. I mean, it was just overwhelming to continue. Um, I also remember orchestrating, and I don't know if I ever wrote things down, but like plays and skits we do during the summer and at school. And um, I would kind of, kind of direct them. And um, if I wrote things down, I, I don't remember. Um, in high school, um, not in English class, but I loved English class. I, I, I remember coming across, um, E.E. E. Cummings, Lawrence Berlinghetti, and saying, oh my, these, these, these poets are, you know, incredible. I've never read anything like this. Um, and then trying in my, from my teenage angst, I think, saying that I want to write. And, and I, I, I sometimes um, jokingly say that, that I was, as a teenager, I was a closet poet. I didn't know anyone who wrote poetry. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it, what I thought of as real people. So I didn't want to tell anybody. I was embarrassed that I was trying to write poetry. It was pretty bad poetry, I think. Um, and I, I studied literature in, in undergraduate school. Um, and then in, in my twenties, I, I tried to write some more and I found some, some groups, um, but it was, it was always a, a, a huge balancing act. With, with my life as, a, as an educator and then a mom of two kids, I didn't balance it very well. I would write occasional pieces, you know, for, for events or celebrations or something. But then I knew that I wanted to return to that. I mean, that's what, where my passion had been young and I wanted to learn. And I, I can remember telling some young people about 10 years ago, I said, and we were in a workshop together and I said, you know, I may have 20 more years to live or 25, but I want to become the best poet I can be in those remaining years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it, it is this chapter of my life where this has become my focus as student and writer is, is to learn the craft. Um, so. And you went to, to get an MFA. Yes, I did. Yeah. I did. And we didn't, we didn't meet each other <laughs> I mean, yeah. you went, I graduated in 2009. When did you start? 20, 10 years later. 10, 10 years, years later. later, yeah. So I think I started 16, 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. Well, I'm so glad that I got familiar with your work later on. Um, so. Well, I, I admire uh, all that you do uh, to support writers, artists, um, throughout, locally and beyond in the world. It's amazing how you have channeled um, what you know and your gifts and given them so freely. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. Um, it, it is my, my pleasure and privilege to talk to writers from all over the world uh, because in a way we are others. You know, uh, you said I was ashamed to uh, to tell anyone that I was writing in high school. I told them, and they made fun of me. You know, I felt other. I have I felt othered for you know for writing for being uh, <laughs> for being a poet. And I also started writing in elementary school, and I know when something starts at that point when a gift just unlocks at that way it will never go that early it will never go away and at some point one way or another it will knock on the door and would want the follow-up <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and 
What are you working on now? Um, a, a couple of things. Um, one is I've, I've been writing a, um, uh, a series of poems about, about my sister. I couldn't write about her for a while, but mm -hmm. I found um, that, that, that there are facets of our relationship. She was five years older. She was my minder in, in, in many ways. And um, uh, just as bringing, having my parents come and be in the study with me when I wrote about them, that's how I'm feeling about my sister uh, as I write about her. So I can bring her back into the room, you know, with me. Um, I also have, I'm also, uh, going back and looking at a manuscript <clears throat> that I finished at uh, Spalding, but uh, before the pandemic, I was going to do something with it and then things got halted and I'm going back to it. I've made resolve. I'm trying to look at it with fresh eyes and determine um, you know, if it holds together as, as, as a piece and to make revisions and changes as necessary and some additions of newer mm -hmm. things. That and I've written, also am returning to, um, I got caught in Spain uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and couldn't get home. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the best thing that came of that, well, we did get home. Uh, the best thing that came though was, was a series of, I wrote a, 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 a crown of sonnets and I, I wanna go back and polish those and then think about what else I might have that may accompany that, that series um, to maybe make a, a, a chapel, I'm not sure. But those, those, that's what I'm working on right now. I, there's a wonderful group of poets, there's seven of us that meet monthly online. Um, we're all, they're Spalding alum or some are currently finishing at Spalding, all poets in, uh, they're very, very careful readers, give thoughtful uh, suggestions and reading. And so that, that group's important to me. Um, that, anyway, that's, that's what I... Sounds to me like you're looking how you can finish projects to submit for publications, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> very much. I wish you good luck with that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to add that anybody who has written a crown of sonnets has my uh, admiration. <laughs> well, I didn't say anything about the quality of it. So. I didn't <laughs> say that. Yeah, I didn't say anything about the quality either. The fact of someone having yeah. written a crown of sonnets, it's mind boggling to me. I don't know how people do it. And only like two or three other people who have done it. And the other thing that uh, earns my admiration is writing a Sistina. That's something that I've never attempted and tempted. Have you? Yeah. No, no, I haven't. I haven't. No, I've written a Villanelle or two, uh, but no, not a Sistina, no. no. I don't think that it will be, um, I don't think it's, you've done the most difficult thing already. In, in my view, so. <laughs> so before we end this conversation, there is, a, there is a question that I ask all my teachers who teach creative writing or literature, and that is, what is the most important thing you teach your students? If there is one thing that you want them to remember from your workshop or from your class, as it pertains to writing, what is it? Oh. <clears throat> um, it is to, um, to have patience with yourself as you figure out and write through what it is you want to say. And it's so have patience with that. That may take time. That may take, you know, energy and, and um, may not come quickly, but figure, figuring that out, what is it that I want to say here is, is so important. And so 
massaging that, giving yourself time and patience to do that. That makes so much sense. Nobody has ever said that. I collect those answers. Nobody oh, has wow. ever said that. And I think you mentioned something like that a little bit earlier when you said about your sister poems. Yeah, yes. we do need to, uh, to be patient until we are ready to write what wants to be written. Yes. Yeah. That's, thank you so that's... much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for talking <laughs> to me, Katarina. I'm so honored. I'm so honored. Thank you. I appreciate you. It's been pleasure talking to you and um, please keep in touch. Good luck with everything, Lenny. Thank you. I will. Bye-bye.